Hello, my name is Goha. Um, I work at Google Web. I'm a Google Fellow and a VP. I've been involved with the development of the web since almost 1994. I'm going to talk to you today about some, some of the core ideas that shape the web. The outline of my talk is as follows. The rise of the, 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 the web is something that we all take for granted today. The extraordinary rise of the web was not inevitable. In fact, it faced a lot of challenges as it was evolving. A few core ideas contributed significantly to its becoming the dominant architecture. I wanna study these ideas by examining how these it beat these challenges. And then if there's time later during the talk, I'll talk about a new project that I'm doing called Data Commons. The internet is a phenomenon and the web is a phenomenon unlike anything we've seen before. There's more than 20 trillion pages. On any day, there's more than 100 million active sites. There's more than 20 billion devices that connect to the internet every single day from servers to phones to garage openers to thermometers. And its size is not the only reason why it's so extraordinary. We have had many generations of computing, mainframes, personal computers, and before that, we've had things like Automa automobiles and air conditioners and refrigerators, each of these things went through a, pace, a phase where they developed rapidly. And afterwards, they all stagnated. The internet and the web seems to be different. It started off in the 70s for the purpose of sharing compute resources. In the 80s, email and the task of sharing papers became significant. In the 90s, we had large-scale information dissemination. In the 2000s and 2010s, we had mobile internet. And now we have the internet of things, and who knows what is going to come next. So why did we want to study the web? I believe that it is an interesting showcase, a case study, for some very powerful but very simple ideas. And these are different from classical engineering principles where the focus is mostly on optimizing a single device at a time. These core ideas show up in many, many non-computing contexts, and I will discuss some of these non-computing contexts. And the idea is that the reason for studying these ideas is that as you go through your careers, as you go around building things, not just computing artifacts, but physical artifacts and maybe even social artifacts, it would be useful to keep these design ideas in mind. And one way of understanding these ideas is by studying the evolution of the web. And as it evolved, it had many different challengers. And if we understand how these core ideas behind the web helped it overcome these various challengers, we get a better insight into this phenomenon. Before I get started, we have to remember that the internet is distinct from the web. The internet in some form started in, in the late 90s, early 70s. The core protocols were done by Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn around 1974, TCP, IP and all of that. Something like host names and DNS were not in the original design of the internet. They came a little bit later in the early 90, uh, 80s. The first set of information services, ways and so on, started evolving around then. It was 1990, almost two decades after the first ideas, the first implementations of the internet that Tim Berners-Lee came up with the idea of a web. The real expansion of the web, the real explosive growth of the web happened only after 1993. Our focus in this lecture is on the period from 1992 to 1997, 
which are sort of the formative years of the web and many, many aspects of the web that came from those years are still the same. So the, I'm going to talk about four design principles today. And the first design principle is what I call optimizing for flexibility. Typically in engineering, we have some optimality criteria, you know, whether it's minimizing the weight or minimizing the latency or something like that. And we optimize the design around that. Sometimes there are one or two factors, objective functions in, that we try to optimize. One of the things that we never learned is the notion of optimizing for flexibility. What do I mean by that? So to understand the historical context of the period from 1990 to 1983, it's not that the concept of online was new. The concept was online was sort of in the air. And there were many contenders for how we would go about accessing online. There was Gopher, from, there were many contenders from universities. There was Gopher, there was a thing called Archie, there was a thing called Waze. There was Usenet, the message board that some of you might have actually, it's still available on the web in some form. There's this thing called Jughead and it was a long list of these kinds of applications. From the private sector, we had AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe, MSN. The interesting thing was, and then it was in this fray that the web entered. And interestingly, most of them had more features than the web. In, 19, in the fall of 1993, Mosaic was released by University of Urbana-Champaign, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It was amazing because unlike these other things, it had images, it had forums, it has CGI bin support for multiple protocols. And in the few months that followed, the web grew by a factor of 350. That is 350,000 person, sorry. After that, it was all done. It was going to be the web. Why did this web thing succeed and why didn't the others succeed? And to give you an idea of the difference between what the first version of the web is and what Mosaic was, we have two pictures over here, which is the first version of the web to the left and Mosaic to the right. The key is that Tim Berners-Lee's web was more flexible. Unlike um, the uh, Gopher and Archie and all of these things, uh, where it said, here is a finished product, use it. Tim Berners-Lee did not present it to the world as a finished product, but as a work in progress. He invited others to contribute. Um, the, the protocols were open, everything was open. And at this point in time, it might look like there was only one web, uh, but at that time, there were so many different ideas for how this thing could evolve. The group at uh, UIUC, Mark Andreessen, Eric Bina, and Rob McCool extended it to create Mosaic. And before them, the web did not have images, it did not have forms or any of these things. The, and it was these features that enabled it to go viral. And in fact, if we use the term viral now frequently, Mosaic was the first thing to go viral. The main goal was to enable rapid mutation. And shortly after Mosaic, the company Netscape was formed and it carried on those traditions by the same people, Andreessen, Bina and others. The main goal was to enable rapid mutation and spreading. For example, it had certain features like view source. You could look at the source for imagine for any page. Imagine if you could lo look at any program and ask for the source code. That was how radical it was at that time. Most publishers hated it, but what it did was that it enabled somebody new who was saw the web for the first time to copy and edit a page. Copy and edit became the dominant authoring tool. Unlike other programming, HTML was a programming languages, and unlike other programming languages, which were kind of pure, this was any, any and all HTML would be rendered. Right now we see HTTP as a dominant protocol and HTTPS, but at that time there was FTP, file colon, vase colon, gopher colon, all of these things. From 93 to 98, it was an incredible growth, not just in users, but the feature set of the browser. You had JavaScript come in, you had different kinds of services come in, then you got Microsoft into the picture, 
who introduced the notion of being able to manipulate the DOM and so on and so forth. The key idea here is that it was optimized for flexibility. The competitors like Gopher and Archie and all of AOL had a very clear model of the product they wanted to build and they optimized for that. In contrast, one could almost say that the web was a little confused and it didn't pretend it knew what the final product should look like. There were many possible design choices and it was unclear which would work. So instead of designing for a particular point in the in optimizing for a particular point in the design space, it was designed for a rapid parallel exploration of the design space. And one of the things I have realized is that in the long run, more flexible systems survive. Let's take another couple of cases where we look where it's very different. It's nothing to do with computing. For a while, there was a big challenge about human powered flight. The grand challenge was to be able to cross the English Channel in a human powered flight, a prize that was eventually won by Paul McCready. Many years ago, I had a conversation with him when he was explaining there when they were designing their plane, they didn't design it to be the lightest or the fastest. They designed it because they knew that as they were going through the design process, they would have many, many, many crashes. And what they wanted to do was after a crash, they wanted to be able to rebuild it quickly and try the next design. So imagine that you're, re you're designing your entire artifact so that you could try the next experiment. Um, there was a, a, a great book by Stuart Brand called How Buildings Learn. And he has gone and studied the evolution of buildings, the evolution of cities over literally hundreds of years. And the thing that he has shown is that in the long run, the structures which survive in some form are those that can change. So we, today we have, you know, these giant, incredible steel designs like the kind you find in, say, Dubai. And on the other hand, you have these shanty towns, these slums. And the conjecture there is that these kinds of communities will probably serve the shantytown kind of communities are undergoing continuous remodel. And in the long run, they are the ones who tend to survive. No one building might look the same, they may look very, but in the end, these are the communities that survive. There is a cost to flexibility. The web is hugely inefficient. We open up separate network calls for every image. The code is largely uninterpreted. I'm sorry, uh, interpreted, it's not compiled. Um, and often the final design is sub highly suboptimal. One of the biggest, the most interesting examples of this kind of an optimization for flexibility is um, the genes. Imagine if you had to put a copy of the whole design in every single component of a complex system. And yet that is what happens with every cell. And every cell goes and does the replication. And the problem, and this gives it incredible flexibility because it allows for, you know, it's optimized by evolution for mutation and an exploration of the design space of possible organisms. But one of the problems is that very often something goes wrong with this replication mechanism and they get things like cancer. So there is a trade off. It's not a simple, you know, flexibility is always better. But in the long run, if you want to build systems, that survive for a very, very, very long time and that evolve, flexibility is an important design criteria. The second design principle is what I call fault tolerance. Hypertext, um, you know, the kind of thing where you click on a link and it goes to the next page, is not new. It dates back to the 1960s. In fact, there was a big project called Xanadu and so on. It never caught on. Earlier hypertext systems all had a central database of links because you know you needed to make sure that no, you didn't have broken links, you didn't have photo force. I mean, that would be a, an awful thing, right? They also didn't tolerate ill-formed markup. They looked at the, the hypertext as though it were code. And when you have code, when you have Java, C++, Python, whatever, you can't, you shouldn't really run programs with a syntax error. You should tell the person there's an error in here. HTML, on the other hand, 
I'm sorry, the web on the other hand uh, was different. There is no central database of links. Links could be broken. In fact, um, the hypertext conferences before the World Wide Web Conference rejected Tim Berners-Lee's paper because they said, what kind of a system is this? It allows for links to be broken. But what this did was that it allowed for fully parallel development, which meant that you could develop your website, I could develop my website without actually coordinating. Uh, other people without can, even talking to us can develop their website. And afterwards, if you want, a third person can come and link to us. When I change my link, when I change a page, I don't have to go inform everybody. Yeah, sometimes the link is broken, that's okay. It also develop, allowed for the development of concepts like the intranet, which is this little piece of the internet behind a firewall, which was not possible if you have a centralized database of links. It was also allowed for what uh, you could think of as fault-tolerant programming. The browser will always try to do something reasonable with your, pro with your web page. The concept of loose coupling and fault tolerance is actually quite uh, interesting because what it enables is distributed coordination. We've been, it's been shown by many studies in sociology and, 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 and collaboration studies that you know, if you have a group of people who need to, co to collaborate tightly, the size of that group can't be more than a few hundred people. If you want thousands or millions or tens of millions to, to coordinate, you need some form of loose coupling. And what this enables is you know, massive parallelism. The, um, there's a relationship between this and the concept of tolerances that we learn in engineering all the time. Um, interchangeable, before 1800 or so, 1802, uh, they, when you, you know, they were manufactured parts like guns and this and that, but they were all, you know, you made part one and then you, you kind of made part two to make sure that it fits in with part one and then you made part three with, to make sure it fits in with the first two parts and so on. Eli Whitney, who invented many things, including the cotton gin and so on, introduced the concept of tolerances in 1802. And what tolerance does is it enables mass manufacturing, which means that one company can make part one and another company can make part two. And so long as they meet the tolerances, a third company can assemble them. The first example of this was, the first large scale example was this, was Henry Ford's Model T. And that his example was, his assembly line was fascinating because it was the first example where so many, at least at that scale, so many different different companies contributed the parts. Fault tolerance and, um, and tolerances in general enable mass manufacturing and mass scaling out. The third design principle is um, what I call an open ecosystem. <clears throat> Before, um, uh, on the one, as I mentioned, on the one hand, you had a number of um, offerings from universities, Archie, Gopher, and all of these things, uh, who wanted to provide a mechanism for users to reach you know, documents of different sorts on the internet. In parallel, there were a number of efforts by corporate players. They didn't really use the internet. They created their own networks. In 1993, um, AOL was the leader. Um, they were giving away free accounts. You used dial-up to connect to their servers, and then you got the content that they gave you. IBM invested heavily in a competitor of AOL called Prodigy. Microsoft realized that this was a very big market, and it created something called the MSN network. An MSN network was going to be bundled with Windows 95. In fact, they spent a huge amount of money on that. Each of these systems was a closed system in itself. Um, they had very impressive tools. They had content partnerships. Uh, they had security. They had commerce. And it, it, there was an interesting... Um, uh, and then the other side, you had the web, which was you know fairly crude. Um, it was mostly students in universities, researchers, enthusiasts, um, there was no security, uh, there was no SSL or anything in 1994. Um, it was truly a David versus Goliath scenario. In fact, um, there was an interesting um, public discussion on um, uh, 94 where um, 
Nathan Merville, who was at that time the CTO of Microsoft, listed off the various reasons why this web thing would never succeed. It had no security, it had no payment, it had no delivery, and so on and so forth. And yet, um, oh, and then sometime in 94, 90, early 95, Bill Gates wrote this book called The Road Ahead. Much of this book was about what he called the information uh, super, super highway or information highway. Interestingly, there was no mention of the internet or the web in that first edition of the book. And yet, by the end of 95, the game was over and the web had won. The contrast between one year was dramatic. A year before then, the best services that were there on the web uh, were things like this coffee camp from somewhere in uh, University of Edinburgh, I believe. On the other hand, you had these online services which had hundreds and hundreds of channels of absolutely fascinating content. So what happened? What happened was that if you wanted, if you were somebody who wanted your content on AOL or Microsoft, you had to go do a business deal with them. On the other hand, with the web, um, you didn't need to do any business deal of any sort. Uh, you just figured out, you know, you found out that there was this thing called a web server and you put it down and you put up a web page. And the web page was very easy to create. You did copy and edit of an existing web page. So how did the web recruit so many people? Because you could, it gave, it didn't, it, there was no barrier to entry. You didn't need to go ask somebody's permission. You could simply contribute over there. And when that happens, every single person who put up an interesting page, but at least when I put up a page, I think it's interesting, I would convince 10 others to go get on this web to see their page. The web was an open system. You don't need anybody's permission. Um, you don't need if, you know, if, if with uh, something like MSN or AOL, they had to decide that they were going to expand from the US to India. And if that was low on their business priority, they didn't. On the other hand, with the web, there was no such thing that was required. People just joined the whole movement. And you can see in these kinds of open systems, they just take off exponentially. The f final design principle I'm going to talk about is the notion of um, a gradual learning or a gradual invest a, 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 an investment curve. So just stepping back, to build something like the web as it is today, there's literally hundreds of billions of dollars of investment that have gone in. Now, people don't decide to make those kinds of investments on a, 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 a single day. You need some easy way, you need a gradual way of saying, okay, I'm gonna make some investment, I'm gonna get see what how it goes and then go on. So let's consider something like a TV show or creating a movie. Um, on a TV show, serving 10 million visitors or viewers is just as hard or easy as serving 1 million because all the investment is upfront. With the web, it is utterly trivial to serve, say, 10 visitors a day. And then if you want to serve 100 million visitors a day, you have to put up more investment. If you want to simply put up a simple static page, it's trivial. You can also do incredibly complicated things. And what this means is that it's a very gradual slope. Simple things are possible. Complex things are possible. For example, and this is true not just at an individual level, it is also true at a collective level. What I mean by that is, you know, the first kind of video broadcast or large scale broadcast of the sort happened in the 98-99 time frame. It was once, I forget what the actual, I think it was a fashion show or something that some company tried to do as a live stream. And it brought down the internet, literally brought down most of the internet it was really slow when that was happening. Today, we don't even think twice about, you know, you're listening to this lecture. And there's probably a hundred million streams going on right now. And so it's with the technologies, with the um, 
the investment from an individual uh, publisher and uh, investment from companies, it's a very gradual slope. And the key idea behind both this and the idea of uh, sort of open systems is that you shouldn't have entry barriers. Systems without gatekeepers show explosive growth phases. Um, we saw that not just in the 94 to 98 time frame where each year the web grew by a factor of a thousand percent. The other kinds of examples where we've seen uh, this kind of a growth are with mobile phones, PCs, um, and even with fax machines. So fax machines are a little bit more interesting. And it is interesting to contrast this with the growth of say landline phones and cars where new infrastructure is needed. Now, it's not always good to have no entry barriers. The web um, with 90%, 95% of the content is incredibly low quality or just something that should just be filtered out. And with email, for every email that you see, that you read, there's probably, uh, you know, Gmail and others filter out, you know, nine, 10 um, pieces of spam. There are downsides and we have to be careful that we have the protections against the downsides. A great example where this kind of a downside, they did, the system was not ready to deal with the downside is Usenet and message boards, where as soon as they opened it up, spam overtook the system and now hardly anybody uses Usenet. A great case study for this kind of uh, easy on-ramp changing the nature of the ecosystem is with textbooks. Before 93, before, before even 2000, in order to publish some piece of curriculum, so supposing I wanted to teach a course on some particular topic, I had to publish a book. That is the way you did it. And if you look at the economics, a book has to sell at least 5,000 copies for the cost of the printing and the typesetting and, and all of that to break even. And for that, if I were to sell that many copies, and I'm talking about technical books and subject books, I'm not talking about fiction over here. A book had to be adopted as a textbook in order to make significant money. Now, there's only so many courses and so many textbooks that are required, which meant that they were, there's very little specialized curriculum. And the decision about whether a book should be published as a, you know, a technical book or, uh, was made not by uh, the readers and users of the book, but by publishers such as Addison Wesley. And they typically went safe and therefore there were a fairly small number of authors. And you see this in uh, say computer science where there's a small number of authors who wrote very well, Jeff Allman for example, and they wrote the same, they were the authors for many books on the topic. With the web, publishers are no longer the gatekeepers. Um, you can write your PDF and you can put it out there and it if people can download it and if people want at some point if the downloads if there is attractive uh, attraction over there a publisher can come in in fact sometimes multiple publishers come in and make it available as a textbook this also means that a very large amount of very special a huge amount of very specialized curriculum is now available in fact um, in many courses now there isn't just a single book there is a series of manuscripts a series of notes and the lines between these things is fading. Um, so that is, those are the four design principles. And the question, of course, that is asked is, okay, so what comes next? There are many things that are coming next. And um, for the next um, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to focus on a particular area that I'm personally working in. Uh, the pro name of the project is Data Commons. You can find it at datacommons.org. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, I set the context by talking about the role of data in machine learning and the different constraints that we face over there and how Data Commons is trying to break through this bottleneck. So taking a step back, every day you learn about AI and machine learning. Um, in fact, it's gotten to a stage where, you know, it's almost sounds magical. 
um, the first time I personally got involved in this field was in 1987. And at that time, hardly anybody knew about artificial intelligence. Um, in fact, when I called my father, I remember, tell, I, I remember calling my father and telling him I was going to move to this field. He was really worried because he had no idea. He said, like, what are the career prospects? What is this new field you're talking about? The core of machine learning over here is, if you, let's look at it from an engineering perspective. The task of engineering at some level can be seen as that of building models. Models are absolutely essential for building, predicting, and controlling systems. What is a model? It's a set of variables that describe your situation and some set of constraints. And these two things together capture the behavior of the system. The model could be about how a turbine works. It could be about how a chemical process runs. It could be about uh, anything you want. It could be about economic systems. These are all different kinds of models. Now, the idea of a, comp a model that you could compute with um, is been around only for a few hundred years. There was engineering before these models. So if you look at some of the big buildings that were built before then the pyramids and, or St. Peter's Basilica, there were no models when they were built, but if you want to go from there to sort of the Dubai Bridge Tower, you need a model. Similarly, when you go from you know, the Kitty Hawk flight to the Airbus, you need a model. At its core, um, there are two kinds of model. The, there's a class of models which I call analytic models. And so if you look at a course in, uh, a, a degree, uh, in mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, um, there's these families of equations. Uh, equations of continuum mechanics, materials, heat transfer, fluid mechanics. And they capture what is happening in a nice mathematical form. And then you take a larger system and you model it with these equations. The key is that each of these equations captures the causal relationship between what is really going on and entire fields of study are devoted to understanding these mechanics. In, we had these systems before computing and um, finite element, you know, when you got into something incredibly complicated, when you went in a, a, to, from building a, a uh, a bridge um, which could be done kind of with just slide rules and so on to computing that the new um, latest Boeing and how much can its wings flex it can flex by 26 feet you couldn't do these kinds of equation calculations by hand and um, so you go from into you people invented techniques like finite element analysis but you still go on this the equations and the models underlying this are still the same kind of models. It's the same small number of equations which capture the underlying phenomenon. There's a problem with these um, kind of analytic models. And the problem is if you consider really complicated phenomenon, today we have COVID. We don't have the basic equations which tell us this is how much the spread is going to be. We have heuristics, we build models. You can see there are 20 models that are floating around different, you know, there's one from the University of Washington, there's one from Oxford, there's one from here. And they're off by factors of 10. Uh, what happens in that kind of traffic jam that we see? What happens, you know, if you have people hanging onto a train like that? What happens in the stock market? Um, all of these things are complex interactions of social, behavioral, medical, economic, and we don't have the basic equations for these kinds of phenomena. Something came up in the last 20, 15, 20 years, which is what I call empirical modeling or machine learning. Um, you take, instead of trying to understand the core phenomenon, you take lots of data and you fit the curve. It requires a lot of data and a lot of compute power, and this has been massively successful in the last 10 years. Um, the first sort of, oh wow, kind of example of this was Google spell correction, where there is no dictionary underlying the Google spelling system. Uh, it just looks at lots of common occurrences of words. It has a very simple idea of which 
keys are next to each other in which uh, on the keyboard uh, and then it kind of builds the model out since then it's been used for news feeds uh, web search advertising and in the last five years we've seen incredible breakthroughs in um, language understanding language translation in vision and so on all of these systems have a similar property, which is that you take in enormous amounts of data, tens of millions or in some cases billions of labeled examples, uh, and then you sort of basically fit the curve in a very high dimensional space. Interestingly, most of these systems are coming from web companies and web ecosystem products. And the reason is that these companies were formed around the time when it became feasible to collect such large amounts of data about the phenomenon that they and their users were dealing with. The question is so much more can be done, right? Can we actually understand what is happening in our society, be able to be predict it better, be able to solve problems? Uh, empirical modeling is for complicated systems what calculus is for ca classical design. You can't imagine doing classical engineering without calculus. And you want to do extreme, this kind of a, understand uh, complex systems, we need empirical modeling. So now comes the whole issue of data. If empirical modeling or machine learning is about taking large amounts of data and essentially building the kinds of super high dimensional spaces and fitting the data in these spaces, well, the core, core hard thing that is required is the data. We have algorithms and interestingly, many of the kinds of systems that are sort of uh, beating records today, the core algorithms have been around for over a decade. Yes, there's been lots of improvements, but the core algorithms have been there. Research is driven in large part by large, new, interesting data sets. And we have seen this over and over again. In genomics, genomics is in such data plays such a large portion of a part of the game. In, even in astronomy, where Jim Gray set up the, slice, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and has changed the nature of astronomy. And of course, many of you must be familiar with ImageNet, where ImageNet was the first big public repository of labeled images, and that has changed the nature of vision research, and it's in large part responsible for the incredible breakthroughs of the last decade in vision. So, if we're going to actually make a difference to the social problems we're talking about, we need a lot of data. The problem is not a shortage of data. Focusing on the US for a minute, because that's where data commons is based. If you look at demographic data, there is census, there's housing data, there's community data, economics, there's the labor department, there's the World Bank, uh, there's the OECD from Europe. In, in health, in India, they have the Ministry of Health. Um, you have CDC over here. Climate, you have a ton of data. If you go into the scientific areas, you have NCBI, ENCODE, and then the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And in fact, that is exactly the problem. In many ways, it's like um, the internet before the web. There's too many different formats, too many different things, too many different schemas. And the current model of using data is if you're trying to build it, and answer a question uh, if you're trying to uh, figure out, you know, what are the which are the areas uh, in a in a in a state which are in greatest uh, danger of COVID spreading? You might say that you know what? Let me look for the nursing homes, the homes where retired the, there are retired communities. Well, you get the data. Where am I going to get the data? You're going to go forage for the data, hunt around for it. You have to track down what assumptions they have made. Where did it come from? Then it's a lot of time to clean it up, compile the data sources, figure out where to store it. And you'll find that you've download, have to download 10 gigabytes of data to use, you know, 20 K of it. There's high upfront cost, sparse ecosystems and few tools. The idea behind data commons is imagine if once, just for once, somebody were to take an enormous number of these data sources. A lot of these things are time series. So let's talk on the order of billions of time series. Take the effort to get the data, clean it up, um, normalize it, 
and build a single aggregated knowledge graph. Such a thing would just be too big for you to download. So you get APIs and these APIs can be used by everybody from, you know, journalists and students to search and news and researchers and so on and so forth. That is the core idea behind data commons. Um, the first version has data about places. It has an, in, you know, for every, in the, it's mostly the US, but it also has data about Europe, a little bit about uh, uh, India, and we're expanding, um, you know, uh, very rapidly into, uh, to incorporate lots of data about that is available from the Indian government. But it has data about everything from economics to uh, elections to uh, weather to, you know, just demographics. Uh, education, disasters. There's also other projects that are going on to do something similar with large amounts of genomic information and even botanical information. Um, access to data commons is free for research and education. There's APIs in Python, Python Notebook, R. It's already in use in many universities in the US. And um, uh, there's a range of graphical tools that you can use. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. There's a version of that called Colab that Google offers. You can use it there. There's tools for charting, plotting, this, that, and so many different things. But all of these things are built on top of the open APIs. Um, we would love for you to participate. Uh, how, you, how can you participate? Use our tools, data, give us feedback, create new examples, tutorials, Build new tools. I'm sure you will find our existing tools to be highly inadequate, but you can help build them. And finally, add more data. Help us add more data. We can, and if you're interested, you can write to us. There's emails on it's the site is datacommons.org. Um, so with that, uh, let me just summarize um, the talk. Um, going back to our design principles. There are certain simple design principles that can have huge effects. And the web is a, a fantastic example of how it shows, it's a showcase of these things. First is optimize for flexibility, even if it leads to a bunch of inefficiency, because in the long run, these flexible systems are the ones that survive. Create and you create uh, these flexible systems, a lot of people will participate in it. And in order to enable a lot of people to participate, you need to create fault tolerance systems. An interesting example comes to mind as we are talking about all these supply chains, they are so highly optimized. When we find that, you know, when the pandemic hit, there's so many parts of it, it's the system as a whole is not fault tolerant. Suddenly, because there is a certain a uh, set of ships that are not coming from uh, one, going from one country to another, you know, we are no longer able to make ventilators in a different country and so on. These systems need to be made more fault tolerant. Create open ecosystems where there are few or no barriers to entry. And finally, make it easy for people to come on board. The general idea here is that these really big things are too difficult for you to do by yourself. You need a lot of help from lots of people. And in order to do that, you have to make it easy for them to participate. And all of these principles, at some much higher level, what they do is they make it much easier for others to participate. These are principles which have universal applicability. Um, we are not yet done. And let me give you a simple, end at a simple story. The, um, we are all familiar with the printing press. Uh, it has changed the nature of humankind. Yet when um, the first printing press was done, before the printing press, books were these big giant things that weighed you know, many, many kilos. And because they were so precious, they were chained to desks and they were mostly there in churches. Europe had maybe you know, uh, 20 to a few hundred books, that's it. When the first printing press was done, it was meant to copy the same kind of book. Um, that is, you made these big giant books. It was 40 years later that Aldous Manutius came up with the idea of a book that could be closed. 
And that was a dr drastic idea at that time. Why would you ever close a book? And he came up with the idea that you could take a book, close it and put it into a saddle. And the first book that was published this way was the German translation of the Bible, which caused the whole Reformation movement and it led to the Protestant movement and so on. So going from step one to step two takes time and every time in, and we're not yet done with the evolution of these things over here. So it's not, you know, many of you think, oh, the web was done. No, we are still in the very early stages of the evolution of the Internet and web and so on. Um, and when you're going, when you all are creating the next generation of things, I'd like you to keep these design principles in mind. And of course, if you can, you know, the things which I'm doing, Data Commons would love to get your involvement. With that, thank you. Um, I can take questions now. Uh, let me see. So um, there's a lot of questions. Thank you. Um, let me just take a question here, which is interesting which is not about the web, which is um, about how do you improve your communication skills? One of the things that many students um, don't realize is how important it is to learn how to communicate your ideas. So much of what we are able to accomplish is done by convincing others to come along with this. In fact, the focus of most of my talk today was on that. Uh, how do you actually do it? It's a lot of hard work. Um, and the way you do that is by practicing, 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 practicing. Um, another question is, how much of the web evolution was accidental versus uh, how much of it was had to happen? Um, I think there were particular details in the revolution of the web, the way, you know, JavaScript turned out, the way the, some HTML DOM turned out and so on, which was accidental. But I believe that in large part, the general direction um, is, there are so many forces involved over here, pushing it in certain directions. Um, it is inevitable. Um, at least that's my belief. Um, let me just bring up the, um, no, sorry, I just need to see the list of questions over here. Um, how is the web related to the current scenario? Um, Can you imagine how the world would be if we had to be on quarantine without the internet? Um, it's, um, I think it is going to emphasize in a very significant fashion. Uh, it's going to have a huge impact on the structure of, there's been a, a phenomenal trend towards urbanization over the last 200 years. For the very first time, we've never brought society to a stop like this and tried to restart it. And we can now understand that uh, um, uh, we can now understand that um, we may be able to go back to a different structure because of this. So um, that's my take on that. Um, Um, 
applicability of I, of technology for higher education. Um, that's a it's a very thing that I feel passionate about, um, and I was fortunate to have um, be, been involved with um, NPTEL in its very early days. Um, Much, you know, whether we succeed, so much of whether we succeed in our life uh, is a function of our education. And um, it's, at least until recently, education was for a very small fraction of the population. What we can do right now with, the, and the reason why education was for only a small fraction of the population for reasons not because it costs so much to teach somebody something. It doesn't cost that much uh, if the person wants to learn. It's all the other things around it. Typically, you have to bring people to a single place. They have to, to leave aside the rest of their life and come there. You need to build buildings, you need to do classrooms, you need to do all of the infrastructure that is required, the physical infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure that is required for education is in large part what makes it so expensive. What the internet can do and what the internet is doing as we are seeing through this crisis is that it can change what we think of education as. Yes, it is true that going and living in a hostel and staying somewhere and all that and interacting with others has serious benefits, has big benefits, but for a person who can't afford that, it's not all or nothing. You can have um, institutions like the NPTEL, which you can educate tens of millions of people and take them out of their current status and to bring them up. There's been a lot of interest around MOOCs. Um, let me talk for a couple of minutes about that simply because I'm so passionate about it. Um, it, with every new kind of medium, with ev you, you, we've seen the following phenomenon, which is that, um, let me give you an example. So when um, TV came, uh, before TV we had radio. On radio, people would get on the radio and read um, scripts because that's what you did. You all, all you had was voice. So when TV came, they would come on the TV and they would read the script. Right? Makes no sense. On TV, you can actually do something different. And we've seen this kind of phenomenon. When telephone first came, telephone was, you know, they would put telephones in the central square in a, uh, in a town and then use it for broadcast. It took, it takes 30 to, in the same, I told you the story of Aldous and in and, 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 uh, publishing books. What we're doing right now with MOOCs is, you know, before MOOCs, we would have, you, everybody comes into a class, professor comes in and sits in the front and he or she gives a lecture. And an entire course is, you know, 20, 30, you know, 40 lectures like this by the same professor. We're doing essentially the same thing with MOOCs. We're taking that and bringing it online. What I'm hoping we will be able to do in the next many years is figure out much more interesting ways of delivering very large scale education, which actually leverages some of the kinds of things that can be done with this medium, which could not be done with earlier media. What would that mean? Imagine a course that is automatically assembled for each student out of many different pieces. Imagine a professor saying, I don't have that, or just somebody saying, I don't have the time to, to devote for six months to teach a course you know, um, four hours of lectures or six hours of lectures every week, which just means another 20 hours of preparing for those lectures. But what I have is an incredibly good way of explaining some concept and maybe some examples with that, so maybe some problems with that. Today, there is no way, easy way for them to contribute to the education ecosystem and for others to pick up. Imagine if we could create a mechanism for these micro lectures, these 15 minute segments, or even shorter or longer. And these things could be easily assembled, just like you can assemble an intranet out of many small websites or many small pages by stringing them together. 
And imagine even one step further with machine learning, if you could say that this student is finding this concept hard. Let me take a detour in the course just for the student and explain this concept. Imagine how fantastic that would be. And imagine if we could deliver this experience, not just for the few select who, you know, get into a big university and all that, but it is almost like a birthright. Everybody could have it. That is the true promise of, um, the, of NPTEL and so on. Um, I'm almost out of time. Um, um, let me see if there's one more question. Um, this is an interesting question. What is the greatest invention of the 21st century? I don't know because it has not yet been done. Um, um, we are very early in the century. A uh, hundred years ago um, was around when, um, approximately a hundred years ago is when they found, you know, the first uh, experimental validation of the general theory of relativity. Uh, very, very, very little. I mean, they didn't even have a vacuum tube then. Right. We have come an incredible distance in the last hundred years. Um, I have no idea what the, the discoveries of the next 10, 20 years are going to be. And um, it's in your hands. Um, with that, I will uh, end my lecture. Thank you so much for attending and all the best.